Hi, this is Joe Thomas. If you've been with us in our study of the book of Acts, you know that uh, we're going through the chapters of the book of Acts on Sundays in Savannah. I'm creating some additional content here in my home studio. And then we have some additional classes uh, on subjects in the book of Acts, not going through the chapters. And what we have tonight is what we're calling the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts part one. And it was recorded on April the 3rd, and here it is for you. Enjoy. Who is the main character in the book of Acts? Holy Spirit, Jesus. Amen. Jesus, Holy Spirit? Characters. Anybody else? All right, there is, uh, that is, well, P, uh, we kind of find out from uh, Luke in uh, chapter one, he tells us in the first two sentences, right? He says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So based on that, what should we expect to see in the book of Acts? Well, more specifically from that verse, did you say something? Yeah, if it says that his first book was all that Jesus began to do and teach, then what we should expect to see in part two is Jesus continuing to do and teach. But of course, how's that going to work if Jesus isn't there? And I think the answer, I think we know what the answer is. John chapter 14, Jesus prepared them for it, even though they didn't get it at the time, because they didn't usually get it at the time, but that's okay. Uh, when we're a little bit slow, God is patient with us. He said in chapter 14, verse 25, All this I've spoken while I was still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. And then in chapter 15, 26, when the Counselor, and that Greek word parakletos is translated helper in the ESV, in the NAS, advocate in the NAS, comforter in the King James. When the counselor comes, I'll send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father. He will testify about me. So you must also testify. It's the same word as witness. Morturos. Uh, for you have been with me from the beginning. And then in chapter 16, verse 7, he tells him a third time. He wants to get this into him. I tell you the truth. It's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go, the counselor will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment, in regard to sin because men don't believe in me, in regard to righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, much more than you can now bear, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he'll guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He'll speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He'll bring glory to me by taking uh, from what is mine, making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. How's Jesus going to do it? How is Jesus going to do an act? He's going to do it through the Holy Spirit, working through the brothers and sisters. Now, would you like to know how many times Jesus is mentioned in the book of Acts? I'm going to tell you, 74 times. The Christ, six times. His anointed one once. Then there's over 100 times we see the word Lord. When they talk to Jesus, they call him Lord. That's the only way he's addressed directly in the book of Acts. But then you've got the Lord, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. And even once it says, Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Now, what about the Holy Spirit? The word spirit is found in the New Testament 338 times, uh, and 64 of them are in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is only 12% of the New Testament, but 19% of the occurrences of the spirit. There'll be a quiz on, on all of this. Um, and then he, he, Jesus told them all the things that the spirit was going to do for them, or at least some of the things in, in what we just read in 14, 15, and 16. He would remind the apostles of what he had said. How did they remember all that stuff? Critics say the Bible can't be accurate because you can't remember that stuff. If you've got the Holy Spirit reminding you, you can. said he would teach them, guide them into truth. He would uh, speak through them. He would testify through them and enable them 
to testify or to witness and to make his will known to them. So that's how Jesus would continue to do and continue to teach in, in, in the book of Acts is through the apostles and through their witness. Now, I, I, I keep looking over here. There's no one sitting here. You know, when you kind of do this back and forth, then it's Elijah sits there, right? If it was Passover, Tom. So that'll be his, uh, his seat. But what I want you to do, and we're just touching this today in this short lesson, is as you're reading through the book of Acts, I want you to look at all the things it says about what the Holy Spirit is doing. Uh, and let me encourage you, if you haven't done this, read through the book of Acts out loud. Uh, I have never read it in one sitting. I believe that we, whenever possible, you should read through a book of the Bible out loud, uh, straight through. You will see things you've never seen before. And uh, uh, Fern and I just had a great reading last week, we went chapter 3 through chapter 8, and it, it was just incredible. But one of the things I want you to think about is what you see it says about the Holy Spirit. And we're, we're just going to scratch the surface tonight. But to understand the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, you need to understand the Holy Spirit in the entire Bible. It starts in, do you know the first mention of the Spirit in the Bible? Genesis 1. Genesis 1, verse 2. Second sentence, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. The Spirit was involved in creation, as was the Father, as was Jesus, as it tells us in Colossians. And studying out and understanding the Holy Spirit is a life long task. I've been a Christian for 45 years, been reading the Bible a little bit longer than that. And I got to tell you, we have to have a little bit of humility when we talk about the Holy Spirit. When someone tells you it's simple, you need to go la, 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 because it's not simple. The, the, first of all, the Bible never defines the Holy Spirit. He doesn't give us a nice package. We have to learn about the Spirit from all the things it says about him throughout the entire Bible, and it's a lifetime of learning. And it's even complicated more. A lot of times you say, well, here's the Hebrew word. Here's the Greek word. That doesn't help a lot. The Hebrew word, ruach, did I say that right, uh, Bob? Bob knows a lot more Hebrew than I do. Um, not that that's a high bar to cross. I don't know a lot. I'm just learning. And the, the Greek word, pneuma, both can mean spirit, wind, air, breath, and so you have to look in the context to see which it means. Even when Jesus said in John 3, the wind blows where it pleases, so it is with the Spirit. Wind, Spirit, same word. And so never oversimplify the Spirit of God. In fact, there's a lot of things in the Bible that God doesn't, not only does he not give us a nice, neat explanation, he doesn't even always give us a word for it. What do we call the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Trinity, triune God, Godhead, none of those words are in the Bible. The Bible never explains the Trinity. It just talks about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we piece it together. God is so deep that we'll spend a lifetime trying to understand it. We're never going to get there. So I have a lot of humility about studying the Holy Spirit with you, and I hope we do. If anybody, it, 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 it's, it's complex, and yet all we can do is look at what it says, and try and understand it as best we can. And today we're going to focus on the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Now, what are some phrases that you see about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, and really you see them throughout the New Testament, that talk about how the Holy Spirit manifests himself in, in people's lives? Like a dove. Uh, like Described as a dove, okay. Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Tongues of fire. Okay, that's one manifestation. Yeah. Gust of wind. Gust of wind sometimes. I think I probably asked the question badly. Um, how we interact or people interact with the Holy Spirit in their lives. I, I, I struggle with how to phrase this question to get the answers I was looking for because it's even hard to do that. Okay, that's something that, that uh, the Holy Spirit enabled people to do sometimes. He's, he intercedes for us in prayer. That's something the Holy Spirit does. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Aha, good. Thank you. It's one of the ones I was looking for. All right, next slide. There are four 
phrases that we see in the book of Acts. And all the things you guys said are things that we see that the Holy Spirit does or enables someone to do along the way. But we'll see in the book of Acts of people receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, I put that word indwelling up there in the notes because we talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Guess what? That's another word that we don't find in the Bible. So we use that word because we don't know how else to describe having the Holy Spirit in us. Secondly, people being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Third, the Holy Spirit coming on people or upon people. And then fourth, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, my goal tonight is to plant some seeds here to give you some things to go back and do more study in. Uh, to be Bereans, you know, go back and do your own study on this important topic and pay attention to what you see. Because almost everything we learn about the Holy Spirit is a narrative. We don't get a lot of teaching about even Jesus, what we read in John 14, 15, and 16. That was directed at the apostles. Not all of that even directly applies to you and me. A lot of that was specific to those guys. And so we have to figure out how would that apply to us? Because we're not the 12. So are these four different things? Or are they symbolism? A lot of times we pay attention to wording in the Bible and you'll see different wording. And sometimes it's meant to show a distinction. Sometimes they're just synonyms, right? Like the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God. Are those different things or those synonyms? Okay. Does anybody else think that? I think they're just, I just, not to disagree with you, I think they're synonyms to describe God's spirit. I think you're, what you're thinking of is Elohim. I think you're thinking of spiritual beings. Elohim, oh my gosh. Okay, yeah, the word, El, yeah, El, that's, um, anyways. So sometimes you'll see different terminology and God's trying to tell us different things. I think in this case, these are four different ways that the Holy Spirit manifests in people's lives. We're going to talk about that tonight. Number one, receiving the Spirit. All right, Acts 2.38. Hopefully most of us have this memorized. I know some of you are very new, but anybody that's been around for a little while, you probably memorized this. Peter replied when the people said, what do we do? He had just told them, you crucified the Son of God, God raised him from the dead. And, he, and when they said, what do we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, who's going to receive that? Well, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This is a promise for everyone, every Christian. Uh, it's not just a thing for certain people. It's nothing flashy. Receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit isn't something that you can see. It doesn't give us the ability to perform miracles or any, anything. It's just God's Spirit in us. And in Romans 8, Paul says, you're controlled not by the flesh or the sinful nature, depending on your translation, but by the Spirit if the Spirit of God lives in you. Well, what if the Spirit of God doesn't live in me? Well, he says, if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. Every Christian has the Spirit. And notice he talks about the Spirit, the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of Christ interchangeably in that sentence. So the indwelling, if I can use that word that's not in the Bible, the receiving, the Holy Spirit's a promise for every one of us. We can all have that. And uh, I think the Holy Spirit does a lot of things for us. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is trying to urge us to do what we ought to do. Fern and I were talking the other day when she was, went to a yard sale uh, in, in uh, 2020 and she's driving around and she had already been to a bunch of streets and a bunch of houses. She's about ready to come home and she passes this street and, and, and she thought, I should probably drive down that street. I really want to drive home. I feel like I should drive down that street. She drove down the street. You know who lived there? Gina. Gina. She went to Gina's house. I don't, I don't remember. She bought anything. And of course, Gina is your sister in Christ today. I think that's the Holy Spirit saying, go, go, go. Now, did it make her do it? No, she got to choose. It was a little friendly nudge. She could have ignored it, but, ignored it, but she did. Now, we can overdo this thing about the Spirit told me to do. Sometimes we decide what we want to do, and we say, well, the Spirit told me to do that. 
we got to be careful about that. You know, when we try and justify what we want to do and tack it onto the Holy Spirit, I don't think God's going to bless that. Do you? Please say no. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah, and again, we're, we're, we're stick and go here. Stick and go. This is stuff that you're going to go back and study more. All right, number two, being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, this one confuses a lot of people. And if someone comes from a Pentecostal background, uh, that person would have been taught that everybody should be baptized with the Spirit. And the sign of that would be what? They would say speaking in tongues if you go to most Pentecostal churches. And with all due respect to our Pentecostal friends, that's not what the Bible teaches about uh, being baptized with the Spirit. Let's let the Bible define its own terms, okay? That's, that's fair, right? Matthew 3, John the Baptist comes and, he, and this is recorded in all four, all four Gospels. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, referring to... No. Jesus, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So John the Baptist prophesied this was going to happen. Did it ever happen during the lifetime of John? No. How about in the lifetime of Jesus? It did not. It was something that was predicted, but Jesus promised the apostles it was going to happen in Acts chapter 1. After he rose from the dead, but before he went back up to heaven, he says, John baptized with water. But in a few days, in not many days, uh, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Prophesied by John, promised by Jesus to whom? The apostles. That's right. Uh, and when did that happen? At Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. That's right. So, the New Testament only mentions one other time that people were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Does anybody know where that is? Yes. The centurion. His name was? Cornelius, Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. 10. That's right. In Acts chapter 10. Well, how do you know, Joe, that was the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How do you know it was the same thing as Acts 2? When you read Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11, Here. Peter explains it. Yes. Peter says, they were baptized in the Spirit just like we were in the beginning. Peter tells us that what happened to Cornelius and his household was the same thing that had happened in, uh, oh, there it is, Acts eleven sixteen. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when you read chapter 10, 11, and 15, you get explanations. And as far as we can tell, the Bible, it never happened again. The Bible tells us about the two times it happened, and it didn't happen in any other time. Now, what was the purpose of that baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 and Acts 10? What happened in Acts 2? The church started. The church started. Okay, what else happened? 3,000 are baptized. And before that happened, what happened? Before the 3,000. Peter? Thank you, Kent. Yes, Peter got up and preached. Now, what reason did people have to listen to this fisherman? Well, when they come out, they suddenly hear the word of God being proclaimed in their own language. It was a sign for the Jews in Jerusalem. Hey, listen up. God is acting here. And then in Acts chapter 10, who was it a sign for? Well, I think it was a sign for the Jews to accept Yes. I think Cornelius would have been fine without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was a sign for the Jews back in Jerusalem. We find that out when we read chapter 11 and chapter 15. But it did help Cornelius and his household realize, hey, but Cornelius was ready for the message. I think it wouldn't have made a difference to him. So what's going on in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10 is God is introducing his eternal kingdom through Jesus to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And its purpose was fulfilled. And if it ever happened again, the Bible doesn't mention it. So is that something that that's available to us today? I don't think so. Yeah. I'm not looking forward to that, but okay, for, 
Of the recording, Kent said, if aliens come from another planet, they're going to need to hear the gospel. So maybe we'll do that. I'll, I'll pass on, on my opinion about that one because we're outside of my, uh, my area of expertise. But if they're anything like the movies, they won't be very open. They're never open when they come here. They want to destroy us. But all right. Now, you know, when I get off my notes, this isn't a good thing, Kent. All right. So as far as we can tell, baptism in the Holy Spirit ended when it fulfilled its purpose. Number three, the Holy Spirit coming on or upon someone. Now, this happened in the Bible in certain circumstances to some people always, apparently, for a specific reason. Uh, because whenever you see the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit coming on someone or upon someone, pay attention to what happens next. There's always something significant that happens right after, and it's usually something supernatural, something miraculous. And there was a purpose behind it, and it was to allow the Holy Spirit to speak, to communicate to people through people. It even happened in the Old Testament. I want to give you one quick example. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, do you remember King Saul? King Saul was the first king of Israel. He started out good. He didn't stay good very long. He rebelled against God. He, he was a big old mess. And in chapter 10, it says, uh, I'm not going to read all of this, but it says that the Spirit of God came upon him, King Saul, in power, and he joined the prophets in their prophesying. And it became a, a saying, is Saul also among the prophets? So King Saul the Spirit came on him for some reason wanted him to prophesy. Well, was this a sign that he was right, to, right with God? No. In chapter 16, it says the Spirit of Yahweh departed from Saul. And then in chapter 19, it comes back on him and he prophesies again when God had already told him, I am absolutely done with you. And in Acts chapter 10, it says the Spirit came upon Cornelius and his household just as Peter was beginning to speak the message. They weren't even believers yet. The sign was before these guys had even become Christians. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon somebody, it's different when the Holy Spirit comes in to our lives when we're baptized. Does that make sense? I know I'm doing this fast. This is just to spur you for further study. We're gonna camp out here in a minute on the fourth one. Uh, so, oh yeah, go back to one more. Oh, there we are, no, I'm sorry, yeah. That one, thank you. Uh, in, uh, here's an example in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 19, if you're familiar with this, uh, in Acts chapter 18, they explained to Apollos about the baptism of Jesus, what he didn't know. And then in chapter 19, they come across a dozen followers of Jesus, and Paul says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They go, what? What Holy Spirit? We never heard there was a Holy Spirit. And he said, and what question did Paul ask him after that? Do you remember? Yeah, under what name were you baptized? They said, John's baptism. He said, good start. But John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And it says, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus then. So when they got baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, what happened? They received the gift of the Holy Spirit. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit and their sins were forgiven. So the Holy Spirit is in them, right? Then Paul placed his hands on them and the Holy Spirit came on them. And guess what they do now? They speak another language and they prophesy. So something different happens when an apostle places his hands on you than when you get baptized. You see that? In fact, in the book of Acts, as far as we can tell, every example we have of people performing some miraculous gift like tongues or prophesy happened after an apostle placed his hands on them. In fact, do you remember in Acts chapter 8, the gospel went to Samaria, right? Yeah. And, and who went up to Samaria? Peter and John. Philip. There we go. All right. Philip, he goes up there uh, and I'm right, aren't I? Yeah, okay. Um, and he baptizes a bunch of people. And then what do they do? Peter and John go up to Samaria, place their hands on people, and then they start speaking in other languages and prophesying. Why didn't Philip do it? Because he, he was an apostle. He couldn't do it. All right, that was really fast.
I know there's so much more we could have covered, but I don't want to spend the rest of the time talking about this fourth one, the one that Elizabeth mentioned, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk about this a little bit because I think it's really overlooked. I know I did for years and years, never gave it a lot of thought. And Fern and I, the other day, we read Acts 3 through 8. We started noticing all the places it talked about being filled with the Spirit. And I want you to look for a pattern. I'm going to read through with you here all the places it says the people were filled with the Spirit in the book of Acts. And I want you to pay attention and look for a pattern, okay? You with me? All right. 6-3. This is when the widows needed to be fed. They, they had to do that. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them. We will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the... Holy Spirit. What did Stephen do next? We know that he fed the widows or made sure they got fed, but it doesn't mention that. We just assume that happens. What does it spend the next chapter telling us that Stephen did? He preached the word to the Jews there in uh, Jerusalem, and then he got stoned to death. In 755, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Okay, Acts 11, this is when they started baptizing Gentiles up in the Antioch church. Antioch is in modern day Syria. And news of this, the many Gentiles becoming Christians, reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So what did Barnabas do? He, yeah, he went and got Paul before that. That's right. He, he uh, preached to people. A great number of people were brought to the Lord. And then when Saul comes to join him, they continue to teach great numbers of people. Chapter 2, going back. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and all of them was the uh, apostles there in chapter 2, and began to speak in other languages, other tongues, as the Spirit enabled them. Uh, now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language and then jumping down to verse 11. The apostles who were filled with the Holy Spirit, the people said, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own language, in our own tongues. Chapter 4, pardon me? Um, I wish I had time to delve into that. I believe it's just the 12. Um, and there just isn't going to be time to get into that <laughs> another time. Uh, <laughs> then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people. It, it could have been. It's possible. It's possible. Um, rulers and elders of the people were being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed. Then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. This man stands before you healed. Peter's arrested. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is what happened. 431, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and did what? Spoke the word of God boldly. Chapter 9, then Ananias. This is when God, Jesus appears to Ananias and goes, hey, there's this guy named Saul I want you to go share your faith with. And Ananias goes, say what? This is the guy that's killing us. I know, I know you're probably busy creating another universe or something, but you know who this guy is. And then he had also spoken to Saul and says, a guy named Ananias is coming to see you. 
Ananias goes to the house. He enters it. He places his hands on Saul and says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He lays his hands on him to heal him of his blindness. And then he says, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And in verse 20, it says, at once, after Saul was baptized, we're skipping over for the sake of time, he went to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Last slide, Acts 13, 9. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elamas, he was a sorcerer, and said, you're a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Okay, so what does Paul do here after it says he's filled with the Holy Spirit? Preaches the Lord. Yeah, he specifically opposes some false teaching. And then lastly, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't say anything after that. That one stands alone. All right, what's the pattern you noticed in all of the, That's all the places in the book of Acts. It talks about being filled with the Spirit. What's the pattern you see in each one of those passages, except this very last verse? They preached the Word. Immediately afterward, they were preaching the Word, with usually with great boldness or with, uh, 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 well, with, with great boldness, really, and, and, and conviction. And the only time it doesn't say that is Acts uh, 13, 52. And so I'm going to guess that they preach the word boldly after that. It just doesn't tell us. So why does God want to fill us with the Holy Spirit? To preach the word, to preach the word with great boldness. Now, we went through that, those passages fast. As you're reading through the book of Acts, take note. Do whatever you do. Underline, take your notes, highlight, whatever you like to do. But when you read it all straight through, it starts to punch you in the face. You see that pattern. When I was in New York, I heard preachers all the time say, maybe you've heard people say this, the Holy Spirit loves to preach. And I just thought that was a preacher line. I didn't fully understand what they meant by it because I hadn't studied this out and, and put the pieces together. But what you see when you read through the book of Acts, we see it again and again, is the Holy Spirit wants to preach through God's people. The Holy Spirit can't do it except through us. Jesus has gone back to heaven. God has not chosen to do sky writing or airdrop Bibles out of the sky. He does it through us. In fact, we remember what the last thing was that Jesus said to his disciples, at least in Matthew's gospel. Again, another passage hopefully we've memorized. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely... I am with you always to the end of the world, to the end of the age. How is Jesus with us always? Be because the Holy Spirit lives in us. So, all of us, if we're disciples of Jesus, if we're Christians, we've received the Holy Spirit. What an awesome blessing. But here's the question. Are you satisfied with having the Holy Spirit or do you want to be filled with the Spirit? I don't think that was the thing just for the first century. I don't see anything in those passages telling me that we can't be filled with the Spirit. It wasn't miraculous. It was just being so full of the Spirit that all that could come out was God's Word. See, having, having the Holy Spirit come on them happened to a few people. Having the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I don't even think it happened to two people. I think it was two events. But is it for anybody? Or was it just for them? I got a verse for you. Ephesians 5.18. Huh? I'm going to disagree with you on that. No, it doesn't say that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It says that they received the Holy Spirit. We read all the passages where it said people were filled with the Spirit. Right. Ephesians 5, 18, 
It says, do not get drunk on wine. Good advice. Actually, a good command, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be what? Now, in the Greek, is that a command? You don't read Greek, but I do. It's a command. Be filled with the Spirit. It wasn't just to some people like having the Spirit come on them. This is something for all of us. We should be filled with the Spirit. It's not just a po possibility. It's a command. So, uh, I forgot my prop. Well, I can use this. This is my water with a little bit of juice in it. What would it take for this cup, this glass, to be filled with Diet Coke? What's the first thing I have to do? It has to be empty of what's in it right now. This would have to be poured out. What's it going to take for us to be filled with the Spirit? We have to get empty of me. If I want to be filled with the Spirit, I have to get empty of Joe. That's why only some people were filled with the Spirit. We read through the book of Acts. It wasn't everybody. They all could have been. But our lives, our hearts can fill with a lot of things that don't leave room for the Spirit. We have the Spirit. We've got the Spirit. But I want to be filled with the Spirit. Does that make sense? That explains why only a few people are really truly filled with the Spirit, but we all can be. This is really, really convicting for me. Because I look at my life and I think, I am not filled with the Spirit right now. I'm not. I, I, I have too much me in there. I've got too much stuff. And if your heart's soft, you're convicted too. Do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I do. And here's the cost. Emptying yourself of you. Now, how am I doing time-wise? I got nine minutes. All right. Huh? Huh? Well, it's 7.51. I'm supposed to stop at 8 o'clock, right? Okay. Good. I can, I can, uh, I had a couple passages I thought I would skip if I ran out of time, but we've got time. What would be the opposite of being filled with the Spirit? Ah, uh, no, don't show them that. I was going to ask them. All right. Ah. Uh, that's my fault. I did put on there to change the slide. All right. I was going to say, can you think of any verses that would be, yeah, that, you can go now. It's up there. That would be the opposite of being filled with the Spirit. And so uh, these are the ones that I could think of. 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, and I put several translations. Do not extinguish the Spirit. Don't treat prophecies with contempt. Examine all things. Hold fast to what's good. The NIV says don't put out the Spirit's fire. ESV says don't quench the Spirit. Uh, uh, the Christian standard says don't stifle the Spirit. So we can extinguish or quench the Spirit, can't we? Yeah. Acts 7, uh, when Stephen was preaching, and this probably helped him get stoned, he said, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you're just like your fathers, you're always what? Resist the Holy Spirit. We can quench it. We can resist it. Imagine when Fern was driving in that neighborhood and she got that feeling you should go down the street. She could, she could have said, I'm tired. I just want to go home. That would have been resisting the Spirit. You see that? It's subtle. It's subtle. And then you've got the extreme here in Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira, how it is that Satan has so filled your heart that you lied to the Holy Spirit. Well, I hope none of us are ever at that point, okay? That, that our heart is filled with Satan. Uh, ho hopefully that's, that's not us, but that's a possibility, isn't it? Yeah. If we care more about how we look to people than how we look to God, that's what can happen. But I think about all the times I've resisted the Spirit. I bet you can too if you stop and thought about it. And I think of so many times I needed to speak and knew I needed to speak, and I just wimped out. And this is one that stood out from my mind. It just killed me. Last year, I'm at the Food Lion. Um, that's a grocery store, not the zoo. And, and there was a woman in front of me, and I heard her accent. And I said, you're from the islands, aren't you? And she goes, yeah, I'm from Jamaica. I'm not going to do it. It's going to be bad. Never mind. But in a really good Jamaican accent that I'm not going to try and do, because that would probably be offensive to somebody. I'll do it so badly. She said, I'm from Jamaica. And I said, man, I just feel like I'm at home when I hear your accent. In Brooklyn, 
all the people that went to my church were from the islands. And I hear that I miss the food and I miss the people. And then after she checked out, she was just standing there. She didn't quickly walk out. I had a perfect opportunity to say, man, are you interested in studying the Bible? Do you want to come to a Bible study? Would you like to come to church? And she, she waited for a minute. Like the Holy Spirit made her stop. And I didn't share my faith with her. And, and I prayed for a couple of weeks after that. Please bring her back to the store. I've never seen her again. I've never heard that accent again. And I resisted the spirit. I went out. And it bugs me to this day. I noticed that she paused. It wouldn't even have been hard. And I just, I feel sick about this. And it's probably been a year or two since this happened. But I do remember a few times where I believe I was filled with the spirit. And, um, this next picture is me when I was a missionary in Bombay. It's Mumbai now. That was me. I had a lot more hair, no bald spot, no gray hairs. And I'm sharing my faith. And I was there for three months. And every day I went, in the, I, I went to what's that, what, the subway. It was an above ground train. Shared my faith with dozens and dozens, dozens of people uh, every single day. And twice I had had people threaten my life. There was this one guy that threatened to beat me up, threatened to kill me. And then a little bit after that, I was on a, a train and I was sharing my faith and people started yelling at me. They started yelling, Hindustan is for Hindus, Hindustan is for Hindus. Throw this foreigner off the train, kill him. And then thankfully, a couple of people said, leave him alone, he's not hurting you. And I didn't die. You, you looked worried, but I, I didn't die. Um, huh? Yeah, I know. Uh, I actually am still the same guy. But a little bit after that, I was by myself in a subway platform, and I started sharing my faith with somebody. And suddenly, about a dozen, 15 people surrounded me on all sides, and they were all around. And I remember thinking, is this it? Is this my time? And I thought, well, if this is my time, this is, this is it. I'm ready to die for Jesus. And I said... I am a Christian. I, this is my Bible. I believe in the Bible. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And I'm here to tell you about it. And I was waiting for them to grab me and throw me onto the track. It turned out most of them didn't even speak English. And they just wanted to see the white guy and wonder what he was doing there. <laughs> but I didn't know that. I was ready to die. And that moment, I believe I was filled with the Spirit. I believe that I was empty of Joe and ready to let anything happen to me. There's probably only been a few of those times in my life. That's the one that sticks out. That story, though, is from 35 years ago. I need stories in 2024 like that. I want to have stories before I die where I can say I was filled with the Spirit. I was empty of Joe and let the Spirit Fill me. Today, age 64, not just age 28, 35, 36 years ago. Here's the choice we get to make. Do I want to be filled with the Spirit? Will I empty myself? And we can see, I believe, some of the kind of results that they saw in the book of Acts when we start being empty of Joe, filled with the Spirit, and let the Holy Spirit speak through us. Uh, Bob, would you close us in prayer, please? Father, no.